So I'm going to talk about um, aortic stenosis and regurgitation. It's a hot topic. It's a common, a relatively common topic, um, something that you will come across on boards and actually in real life as well. Um, so to start with, I'm going to talk about some of the congenital anomalies of the aortic valve, which give rise to both stenosis and regurgitation. Then talk for probably most of the talk on aortic stenosis because it's the most important part of the most important uh, lesion that we see, and then talk about aortic regurgitation. So just to introduce you to the aortic valve again, the normal aortic valve is tri-leaflet, and uh, here are the three leaflets. It opens at the center uh, in a triangular, when it opens, it opens in a triangular fashion. In about 2% of the population, two of the leaflets fuse uh, in utero or may actually have been fused, uh, maybe only two uh, sinuses formed, and you end up with two leaflets. Now, this can uh, give rise to a normal hemodynamic status without stenosis or regurgitation, but often gives rise to stenosis uh, because the, the leaflet can't open enough, or it can give rise to regurgitation because this big conjoint leaflet prolapses and there's regurgitation as a result. And I'll show you an example of that in a few minutes. The other less common but equally important is the unicuspid valve. Unicuspid valve is something we see where the, there is only one commissure usually, and instead of opening all along on the diameter of the, of the uh, aorta. This opens, if you like, on the radius. So there's just one commissure opening. It opens like a buttonhole. And this is inherently stenotic, or almost always stenotic, often very stenotic uh, in early life. And these people present with uh, stenosis in adolescence or in uh, early adulthood. So here's an example of a bicuspid valve, and uh, as it's opening, it opens like a football, or at least a, an American football, uh, not a real football. Uh, uh, here is a prolapse of the, uh, of the conjoint leaflet, and as you can see, there's uh, regurgitation away from the uh, prolapsing leaflet. So the important thing I, I think you need to know about bicuspid valves is they're pretty common. They occur in 1% to 2% of the population. They can give rise to either stenosis or regurgitation. They tend to be familial. So there's about a five times greater chance that if you have a family member with bicuspid valve that you'll have it. So it's about 10 to 11% in family members. And most importantly is we've begun to realize that it's often associated with aortic root enlargement. And this is important because this can go on to give rise to uh, uh, dissection. And bicuspid valve is one of the commoner causes of dissection. And this wasn't uh, understood until fairly recently. And so the new ACC AHA guidelines suggest that when you're looking at a bicuspid valve, you look at the aorta size very carefully. If the aorta is greater than four centimeters, no matter how much regurgitation or stenosis are there, these people should be followed yearly. And surgery for the aorta is indicated if the aorta becomes greater than five centimeters or there's a single uh, increase in size of greater than 0.5 centimeters in any given year. Uh, if somebody is going to have their aortic valve replaced anyway because of the bicuspid valve, if the aorta is greater than 4.5 centimeters, you should consider replacing the aorta at that time. So these are sort of new guidelines, things that you probably should know about. The other important thing is that beta blockade is indicated, it's a class two indication. Mike went over what the, the different classes were. Uh, 2A is a pretty strong indication that if the aorta is greater than four centimeters, you should consider using beta blockade to slow the rate of progression of the aorta enlargement. This is, except in the case of severe AOR, in severe AOR, by slowing the heart rate, you lengthen diastole, and you tend to make, as AOR is a diastolic phenomenon, you may make the regurgitation worse, or at least its hemodynamic consequences worse. If you can't see the aorta well by echo, 
you should go on and do an MRI or CT. So there, that's really all I'm going to say about congenital anomalies uh, now. Let's talk about aortic stenosis. So there are two main types, two main causes of aortic stenosis these days, uh, a tricuspid degenerative valve. This is something we've begun to learn a fair bit about the pathophysiology of. Um, it doesn't happen by chance, uh, about, it's not just wear and tear. It, it occurs in about 4% of those people over the age of 80. It doesn't occur in everybody. Uh, and the risk factors for it are, as we'll see, are similar to those for atherosclerosis. And uh, typically, calcium is laid down on the body of the cusps. Uh, in bicuspid valve, which is the other common cause, you also get degenerative changes. These tend to be aggravated by the fact that there is, uh, the bicuspid valve is, is there. Um, and uh, these people tend to pre present in their 50s or 60s with stenosis these people more in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. So uh, the other thing you need to know is that normally the aortic valve area opens about three to four square centimeters, but we really don't expect symptoms until the valve area gets to less than a square centimeter, at least in a normal-sized individual. We have a, there's a fair bit of uh, leeway there. It really takes uh, quite a, a lot of stenosis for us to become symptomatic. So if somebody has a valve area of one and a half or two square centimeters, and they're experiencing symptoms of shortness of breath or chest pain, we wouldn't necessarily attribute that to aortic stenosis. So these are the recent guidelines in terms of uh, defining the severity of aortic stenosis. Notice they're pretty much all uh, based on echocardiography. We now use echo as the, our primary way to define the presence of aortic stenosis, but also its severity. So by jet velocity, greater than four meters per second is considered severe, a mean gradient of greater than 40 millimeters of mercury, a valve area of less than one square centimeter, it used to be 0.8, it's now less than one. And in this era of bariatric surgery, uh, it probably makes sense to index these. And if you're indexing it to body surface area, you probably should, it's less than 0.6 uh, square centimeters per meter squared. So that's these are the, the numbers that you should be familiar with. Now, as you know, the pathophysiology of aortic stenosis is it's interesting. The, the narrowed valve causes the left ventricle to hypertrophy. The ventricle, is, left ventricle is amazing in that it hypertrophies to normalize wall stress. It can do that for a long period of time. Eventually, it no longer can do it and you get LV systolic failure. But the left ventricular hypertrophy itself gives rise to a stiff, uh, stiffening of the ventricle, and that, of course, uh, gives rise to diastolic dysfunction, and that can also cause symptoms of shortness of breath and heart failure. Now, we typically define the presence of aortic stenosis by a pressure gradient, with the left ventricular pressure being higher than the aortic pressure, and certainly, Typically, the higher that pressure gradient is, the more severe the stenosis. But there are situations where that may not be the case. In somebody who has a relatively flow, a low flow state, somebody with left ventricular failure, for instance, you may have relatively low gradients, the so-called uh, low gradient aortic stenosis. And in somebody who has a big shunt or who has an awful lot of aortic regurgitation, there's so much flow going through the valve that the gradients may be high even though the stenosis isn't that severe. So typically when we're assessing aortic stenosis these days, we just don't assess the gradient, we assess the valve area. And there are different ways of doing that. But the most common way we use is continuity, and I'll go through that with you in a minute. So you know the sort of clinical presentation. Uh, most people that I see who have aortic stenosis are pretty asymptomatic. Well, now, they may say they're asymptomatic, but when you speak to a family member, a family member say, well, you know, he's actually slowed up quite a bit, and he's not doing as much. And that's the thing about valve disease, that it often comes on relatively slowly, and people are ardent aware how compromised they've become. So it's important to get objective evidence from a family member where you can. Um, so dyspnea is a common, uh, is, is very common. Uh, Presentation, it can occur early due to diastolic dysfunction, later from systolic heart failure. Systolic heart failure is commoner in men. 
Chest pain uh, is also pretty common, even in normal coronaries, because the ventricle is so thick and it, it's hard for the, the coronary, there's a limited or relatively fixed cardiac output. There's not enough blood going to the subendocardium. You can get subendocardial ischemia. So chest pain, uh, angina can occur even in the presence of normal coronaries in up to 50% of these individuals. And there are multiple reasons why people get syncope, from abnormal baroreceptor responses to arrhythmia. But probably the most common is that people can't increase their cardiac output uh, when they're exercising, so they get some uh, cerebral malperfusion and uh, they feel lightheaded. Um, this is probably the least common of the symptomatologies associated with the aortic stenosis. And fatigue and low output, uh, from low output is very common. Uh, the physical findings in aortic stenosis, uh, you probably are very aware from medical school, but they really have pretty limited sensitivity and specificity, probably about 70% sensitivity in terms of the, the, uh, the carotid pulse, the slow uh, rising uh, low volume pulse, pulse the so-called anacrotic pulse, is uh, probably the best sign, uh, so, of course, with the, the murmur. Um, the presence of a thrill usually indicates a pretty severe aortic stenosis. Um, typically, the murmur is harsh and late peaking, <clears throat> radiating to the carotids and may radiate with a, a different frequency to the apex, the so-called uh, Galibardin uh, phenomenon. And often there's a fourth sound, a soft A2, because uh, the valve is calcified. And in a, a young person with a bicuspid valve, you may hear an opening click um, sometimes mistaken for mitral valve prolapse. The main test for aortic stenosis these days is echo, but we still do cardiac catheterization to define coronary anatomy if somebody's going to surgery, but also occasionally if there's a big discrepancy between the echo findings and those on physical examination. And so to do this, we do it with the Usually, nowadays, we do it with two catheters, or at least a, a dual port catheter, to measure the, directly the pressure gradient uh, in the left ventricle and in the aorta. And uh, this is uh, uh, probably five or six times a year I will ask my uh, cath colleagues to, to do this. Um, when you're looking at a aortic stenosis, looking at the pressure gradients, well, let's look at a normal uh, pressure tracing first. So this is the left ventricular pressure tracing here, and this is the aortic pressure tracing. They're fairly superimposable in systole. There's not much pressure gradient normally. But in aortic stenosis, it's different. The pressure gradient is higher throughout systole in the left ventricle, and there's a late peak. So this is the carotid or the anacrotic uh, response, slow rising, late peaking pulse, because it takes a while to open that thickened stenotic aortic valve. Uh, this is the aortic pulse. And so when we are, there are two <clears throat> uh, ways of measuring the pressure in the, uh, across the, the valve. One is to measure the instantaneous pressure, and this is what we measure by Doppler. It's the highest pressure gradient at any time through systole. The other is to measure the peak to peak gradient, and that's the one we typically measure by cath. Notice the peak-to-peak -peak is always going to be lower than the peak instantaneous gradient. It's just something to be aware about. If you measure the mean gradient, the mean gradient over time across systole, that should be the same if the, if the, uh, if the procedures are done simultaneously by echo and by cath. Now, um, that's, and, and that's really the one that you should look at. And if that's greater than 40, then you have severe aortic stenosis. Now, a couple of uh, equations, they're pretty simple, uh, but they're very important in terms of all valve disease, but particularly aortic stenosis. So the Bernoulli equation, Bernoulli, I think, was a, a French mathematician, um, and he, uh, he recognized that you can uh, change or you can uh, measure pressure from the velocity of flow through a fixed orifice. And the simplified equation, I'm not going to go, it's a pretty big equation, but it can be really simplified to 4 V squared. So if the velocity is 4 meters per second, the pressure gradient across that narrowed aortic valve is 4 times 4 times 4. 
it's uh, 64. So four times the velocity squared. If it's, if it's two, then it's two squared by four, which is 16. So this is one of the key uh, equations that you need to know. It's very simple. It's like E equals MC squared. In fact, this is the E equals MC squared of, uh, of uh, valve hemodynamics, okay? So this is, this is something you really need to know. Uh, the other one is in, if you're looking at flow in a tube, and the heart is a tube, basically, then the flow is given as the cross-sectional area of that tube times the velocity. And if you know the velocity and you know the area, you can calculate the flow. If you know the flow, and you know the velocity, then you can calculate the area. And that's basically what we do in continuity, and uh, in the continuity equation. Now, when we're looking at uh, trying to measure velocities at the aortic valve, it's important to look at multiple sites because the velocity in an individual person may not be just at the apex. It could be at the right sternal border or the suprasternal notch. So this is the, how we measure the valve area. We measure the flow in the left ventricular outflow tract, and we do that by measuring the cross-sectional area of the left ventricular outflow tract. We measure its diameter by echo on the peristernal long axis view, and pi times the radius squared is the cross-sectional area. We can measure the velocity in here by pulse Doppler. Velocity times cross-sectional area is flow. And then if we know the flow, the highest velocity, uh, sorry, at the valve itself from continuous wave Doppler, we can solve for the area. So the flow divided by the peak velocity gives us the cross-sectional area. And this is continuity. So it's a very easy way. It's not there are some, uh, you can have mishaps in how you measure the, the radius here. But in general, it works very well. And it's pretty much what we use now to follow patients. And, um, it's been, uh, it's been something that's been established for uh, two decades. Uh, again, if you can't measure the cross sec if you can't measure the diameter uh, very well, you can get an estimate as to how bad the aortic stenosis is by dividing the velocity in the left ventricular outflow tract by the velocity at the valve itself. If this is greater than 0.3, so-called dimensionless index, then you're not dealing with severe aortic stenosis. Now let's just go on and talk about some of the other things uh, about aortic stenosis. I said already that it has similarities to, at least degenerative aortic stenosis is similar to atherosclerosis. This is a cross section of the valve. This is the ventricular side, the aortic side. There's a lipid infiltration, there's calcific infiltration, there's an inflammatory infiltrate, all very similar to atherosclerosis. And it turns out that the things that cause progression, or at least are associated with progression of aortic stenosis, are hyperlipidemia, hypertension, diabetes, age, and coronary disease, all things that obviously are underlie uh, atherosclerosis. So typically, we see about a 0.1 square centimeter decline in, a, in the valve area a year in people who have at least moderate aortic stenosis and who are older, over the age of 60. So this is a, a typical progression, uh, though it can be quite variable. And when you're thinking about aortic stenosis, the most important predictor of long-term outcome, or, or there are two rather, one is left ventricular function. If that's down, the outcome is, is going to be poor unless you do something about the stenosis. And the same, once somebody develops symptoms, they are much more likely uh, to go on and have a bad outcome, and we'll show some data on this in a minute. So we and others have been interested in the use of statins in trying to slow the rate of progression of aortic stenosis. It's an atherosclerotic process. We thought maybe we could slow this. And certainly in hyperlipidemic patients, it does seem to slow the progression of stenosis. But in people, and there have been uh, quite a few, there are at least three randomized prospective studies now in non-hyperlipidemic patients including the Salter study, in which statin had no effect on progression of aortic stenosis. So statins are not indicated uh, in, except for the treatment of hyperlipidemia in aortic stenosis. They're not uh, specifically indicated to treat aortic stenosis itself. Uh, there's ongoing studies. We've been interested in some other things like calcium 
uh, and uh, drugs that affect calcium properties. Again, we haven't found that these have any uh, effect, at least in more severe aortic stenosis. Perhaps we need to start somewhat earlier. But that's the, the state of play in terms of statins right now. So like we talked about, the uh, survival for aortic stenosis uh, here in green is shown once you have symptoms, in yellow is if uh, you don't have symptoms. All-cause mortality is much worse. Uh, cardiac death is much worse once you have symptoms, and so is sudden death. So the main indication for intervention in aortic stenosis are the onset of symptoms. Now, their medical management, there isn't a lot we can do medically uh, to prevent the progression of aortic stenosis except manage hyperlipidemia. You certainly want to avoid severe vasodilators. People often ask me about ACE inhibitors. Uh, most people, when I see them, are already on an ACE inhibitor, and if they're already tolerating it, uh, I don't stop it typically. Uh, I do tell people to be very careful if somebody has severe aortic stenosis with nitroglycerin by reducing preload, you often uh, can cause, uh, you can precipitate uh, syncope in these people. But with the advent of percutaneous uh, uh, catheter approaches to replacing the aortic valve, I think we're not going to see a lot of medical management. As probably you are aware, uh, over the last year, there's been a, a trial, the partner trial, which has shown much better outcomes in patients who were treated elderly patients, uh, I think the average age was AG3, who were considered inoperable, but who received a percutaneous valve versus medical treatment. It was published in the New England Journal. The outcomes were much better in those receiving percutaneous valves. So the era, it hasn't been approved yet, but likely will be in the, within the year. So I think that's going to be a sea change in how we manage very ill patients or patients who have a lot of surgical comorbidities. So what are the guidelines for uh, aortic valve replacement and aortic stenosis? Well, the, the original guidelines were in 1998. They changed a little bit in 2006. Still, the predominant indication is symptomatic deterioration in a patient with severe AS. Or somebody who's going for surgery for another condition, a, a cardiac surgery, and who has either moderate or severe aortic stenosis. The other uh, indication is in the absence of symptoms, the prime indication is somebody who has left ventricular systolic dysfunction. That's an EF of less than 50% that you attribute to aortic stenosis. And uh, that shows that the ventricle can no longer compensate, and it's considered an indication for treatment. Um, the onset of uh, ventricular tachycardia or changes on exercise are also considered, uh, were considered indications for surgery, less so today. I mean, the onset of ventricular tachycardia in, in these patients is uh, a relative uh, indication for surgery, but uh, the response to uh, exercise is less so, or the presence of uh, left ventricular hypertrophy is less so. One of the new things, though, that has come out is that now it is considered reasonable to offer prophylactic surgery in people who have very severe aortic stenosis. That's a valve area of less than 0.6 square centimeters. If the place that you're going to have surgery, they're going to have surgery has an operative mortality of less than 1%, you can consider doing surgery in those patients. This is new. Before we used to say, or people had said that the biggest cause of uh, uh, death in uh, asymptomatic aortic stenosis was unnecessary surgery. Now, we, surgery has gotten much better, and so there is an indication in these people. And certainly, if there's a high risk of progression, and, or you feel that somebody's going to be lost to follow up, then you may recommend uh, that they have surgery. And actually, I saw somebody like that yesterday who had a valve area of 0.5 square centimeters. She really isn't very symptomatic. So she's getting more fatigued, and I said, look, you know, you're going to, this is going to happen sooner or later, and why don't you pick a time and get this over and done with? So there really are the main indications that you need to know about. In terms of what are the valve options, um, in the pediatric age group, we can open the valve with a balloon, and it works pretty well for congenital uh, valve disease. Balloons don't work very well for 
degenerative disease or for calcific disease, it will cause an increment in the valve area of about 0.2 square centimeters or so, maybe some relief of symptoms, but restenosis within about six months is the rule, and it has absolutely no effect in multiple studies on mortality. So we don't use balloon valvuloplasty now, except as palliation or as a bridge to a more definitive therapy. The things that, the types of valves that we use are defined by, um, we can use a, a, a mechanical prosthesis. The big advantage of those is that they last a long time. The big disadvantage is that they require long-term anticoagulation. And so in younger people, we tend to use mechanical prosthesis because we don't want to send them to surgery multiple times in the future if we can avoid it. Uh, bioprosthesis are excellent in older people. And once you're 70 or so, uh, there, you'd want to have a very good reason not to have a bioprosthesis. Uh, bioprosthesis typically in that age group will last about 15 years. But in a young person, they'll last, you know, and somebody in their 20s maybe last five to seven years. Somebody has pregnancy on top of that, maybe even less. And that appears to be due to uh, the cardiac output. The higher the cardiac output over a long period of time, and this is uh, what we see in younger people, or, and calcium turnover seem to impact the degeneration of bioprosthesis. The holy grail at the moment is to find a way to put in bioprosthesis, make them last longer, or maybe switch them out with a percutaneous procedure. That's really where a lot of, this, a lot of the work at the moment is, is going on this, because uh, most people would prefer to have a bioprosthesis than a mechanical valve. Uh, you're not aware of the click, and you don't have to worry about anticoagulation. So um, that's where the field is going. But we still use mechanical prosthesis a lot in younger people. We've been disappointed with homographs, uh, human valves. They don't tend to last as long as we had expected, even in younger people. And uh, in older people, they're certainly no better than a bioprosthesis and they're much harder to take out when you have to come to reoperate. The ROS procedure is an interesting procedure where we take the patient's own pulmonary valve and put it in at the aortic position, and then put a pulmonary homograft in at the pulmonary position, putting the native valve where it's needed most. It works, um, but there have been, the pulmonary valve isn't as easy to deal with in the future. It tends to cause problems. But it's a very good procedure in adolescents or young adults because where the patient's still growing, the autograft or the pulmonary valve at the aortic position grows with the patient. And uh, it's a useful from in that point to, in, in those people. Um, we are now seeing more and more patients who are coming back. And Dr. Peterson, one of our surgeons here, does the reverse ROS procedure. He takes the pulmonary valve out of the aortic position, puts it back in the pulmonary position, and puts a a new valve in the aortic position. We've done about 10 or 12 of those, and they, actually they've all done fantastically well. So uh, like I said, percutaneous prosthetic valve implantation is here to stay. Uh, it's very exciting for us. Um, it's, uh, it's a technical tour de force at the moment. Uh, we're getting better at it. Uh, it's not ready for boards or for prime time, but it is certainly will be something that you will see a lot in your car careers. And uh, you will. I think the other important thing for you to realize is that even in very elderly patients, the outcomes are excellent in carefully selected patients who go to surgery. And so is uh, quality of life. Um, asymptomatic aortic stenosis, uh, the risk of sudden death is about less than 1% a year. And if you follow these people closely, you can, it's very safe to follow them. As long as you do an echo every six months you're, you, and tell them, that they need to call you if they're having symptoms. There are two groups, though, that are more likely to progress. If you have severe aortic stenosis, if the velocity is greater than four meters per second, this is the likelihood of being free of surgery at uh, about three years. It's pretty low. Once you have a severe aortic stenosis, you're likely to require surgery or be symptomatic within about two years. If you have a lot of calcium on the valve, this is the chances of this happening go up a lot more. Now let me just talk briefly about low gradient aortic stenosis. So these are patients who have severe left ventricular dysfunction, usually an EF of 30% or lower, uh, have relatively low pressure gradients across the aortic valve, maybe 25 or 30, and the valve area comes out at 
you know, severe. It's less than one square centimeters. And one of the things you're asking yourself is, is this left ventricular dysfunction, did this occur because there was severe aortic stenosis that now the ventricle has failed? Or is this because this is a cardiomyopathy and the ventricle can't generate enough uh, oomph, if you like, enough uh, force to open up a somewhat thickened, maybe mildly stenotic valve? And so the way we try and figure this out is with the butamine echo. We don't give lots of debutamine. We usually go up to about 10 mics. And we measure the valve area at each stage. And we look at the pressure gradients of each stage. If this is cardiomyopathy, then you won't see very much effect in terms of the pressure gradients. The valve area may actually go up because there's more, more flow going through the valve. Whereas in somebody who has real aortic stenosis, what we expect to see, as has happened here, is that the gradients go up a lot, then the valve area doesn't change very much. These people, even though they have a high surgical mortality, their mortality without surgery is so high that they, uh, they, they do much better with surgery, even though the mortality is probably of the order of 10% uh, in these folks. But if you don't send them to surgery, they'll probably be dead uh, within uh, a year or so. This is a group, again, that percutaneous valve implantation may, may be uh, suitable for. And often uh, we look to see if the ejection fraction and the stroke volume in increases with the butamine. If it does, uh, the prognosis tends to be better. Now, in the final few minutes, let me talk about aortic regurgitation. Uh, here's an example of reg aortic regurgitation on Doppler. Uh, here's the uh, three-chamber view. Got a plume of aortic regurgitation there. When you're thinking about aortic regurgitation, you should think about a couple of things. First is what's causing it. Second thing is how severe it is. And the third thing is the effects on the left ventricle. They're the sort of three uh, areas that we're interested in. In terms of etiology and mechanism, again, like uh, Mike Linkoff, it's easier to think about these in, in, in bigger terms. You can divide it into uh, either it's valvar or it's due to the aortic root. Uh, valvar is when there's uh, a problem with the, the valve itself, either a bicuspid valve or there's changes in the leaflets with rheumatic disease or, or degenerative disease or endocarditis. Aortic root, the aortic root has gotten bigger. The leaflets aren't big enough now to close, cover the orifice. And this occurs with an aneurysm of, of any kind, uh, Marfan's, uh, atherosclerotic, hypertension. And so they're the, the two, two big causes. Uh, here's an example of endocarditis of a bicuspid valve with leaflet perforation and a vegetation, uh, something we see not infrequently. And uh, sudden uh, acute aortic regurgitation is, can be life-threatening. Uh, it can occur with dissection or endocarditis. Typically, this is the M-mode echo appearance, uh, early closure of the mitral valve. And we can actually see, if you look carefully, there's there's a little flicker on the mitral leaflets from the aortic regurgitation hitting it. Um, this can cause sudden heart failure. The ventricle can't expand fast enough to compensate, and these people can die if you don't get them to surgery quickly. While you're getting them to surgery, after load reduction and increasing the heart rate by, by uh, shortening diastole, uh, this may, have, uh, may actually help. So the pathophysiology of AR is that there's a volume overload of the left ventricle, a severely increase in afterload, a compensatory eccentric, eccentric hypertrophy. EDP is preserved. You don't get an increase in pressure until late in the course. Once this occurs, it's progressive, and left ventricular failure uh, can occur quite rapidly uh, towards the end. But it usually has a very long course. Uh, once uh, failure is established, uh, especially if left ventricular function has been down for more than a year, the likelihood of complete return of left ventricular function is reduced. And um, we try and intervene before that happens. Uh, again, most people are asymptomatic. It can present with heart failure symptoms. Uh, even in the absence of coronary disease, it can present with angina because of the huge uh, ventricle and the thickened myocardium. And of course, it can present with endocarditis. The physical findings are, are fun, but the one that you really need to know is the, the murmur, which is an early diastolic murmur, decrescendo murmur, 
uh, hard at the left sternal border typically. Now in acute AOR, it may, you may not hear it very much, EDP is so high, there may be very little pressure difference between the uh, aorta and left ventricle, you may not hear that much, but in chronic AOR, the longer the murmur, the, uh, the, worse it, the more severe it is. The Austin Flint murmur is an apical diastolic murmur. The jet, like we saw there, is hitting the mitral valve, it causes the mitral valve to close a bit. In the old days, this used to simulate uh, mitral stenosis. Um, I don't think it appears in boards very much anymore. It's just a kind of a fun thing to know. It's an apical diastolic murmur uh, from mid-closure of the mitral valve from the regurgitant aortic valve, uh, regurgitant jet from the aortic valve hitting it. So again, the major criteria, major things we look at uh, in assessing AOR is echo adapter. Uh, cardiac cath, uh, we also would use uh, if we were unsure about the severity of the regurgitation or it didn't agree with our, uh, our echo findings were, were somewhat different uh, from, the, um, from the physical findings. Uh, MRI is useful in looking at the size of the aorta as is CT. And uh, we look at the height of the jet in the left ventricular outflow tract. Uh, in, this is probably the best way of assessing the severity of the AOR. Uh, there are other things that we can look at as well. Uh, such as the presence of flow reversal and the descending aorta. These are semi-quantitative. It's not, uh, the assessment of AOR is a little bit more difficult than it is in terms of MR. And uh, these are the recent criteria used by ACC AHA. I'm not going to go through, just, just to say that if you have severe chronic AOR, you really should have some evidence that the left ventricle is dilated to make this call. And so the natural progression, like I said, is pretty slow. People uh, progress slowly. They often go for many years, even with severe AOR, without needing anything done. The risk of sudden death is very low in the absence of symptoms. So is uh, left ventricular dysfunction. But once you develop left ventricular dysfunction, your likelihood of symptoms is, in, is very high at three years. And once you have symptoms, there's a very high mortality of more than 10% a year. So the things that we follow are the size of the left ventricle and symptoms. And so we typically will follow these people with a serial echo. If the more severe the regurgitation is, the more, com more frequently we follow them. Uh, typically it will be uh, every six months um, if once it gets uh, quite severe. And we recommend surgery if there's significant aortic regurgitation and symptoms. In the absence of symptoms, there are a couple of criteria that we use. If there's left ventricular dysfunction, if the EF is less than 50%, that's a sign that the ventricle can no longer compensate. That's a class one or a main indication for intervention. The other is if the ventricle has dilated to such a degree that you're that there's a risk of sudden death, and that's once the ventricle is greater than about 50 millimeters in end systole or 70 in uh, end diastole. And these are, as we'll see, the, the guidelines are a little bit less than what I'm saying, are a little bit, uh, a little bit I'm being more conservative than the guidelines, uh, but the guidelines many of us feel are, are a little extreme. The other thing is if the aortic root is greater than five centimeters and somebody has significant AOR, you should send them to surgery because of the risk of dissection. And so the, the guidelines, uh, left ventricular dysfunction or symptoms, the guidelines say that the end systolic dimension has to be greater than 55 millimeters or the end diastolic dimension greater than 75 millimeters be in the absence of symptoms before you consider surgery. But as I said, most of us feel this is rather extreme. I would go an end systolic dimension of 50, end diastolic di diameter of probably the high six is certainly no more than seven. Uh, I, that's just based on my experience. And then finally, uh, there is medical treatment for aortic regurgitation. There is evidence that afterload reduction may slow the rate at which uh, of onset of symptoms and may put off the evil day of surgery. Uh, certainly there was a study with nifedipine that showed this. A more recent study um, wasn't as convincing. But we use afterload reduction in people who have systolic hypertension, 
or if we really, there are good reasons to try and put off surgery for as long as possible. You shouldn't use medical treatment in patients who are good surgical candidates who have symptoms, though. You really should send those people to surgery. And as I said, if somebody has a, a big aorta, uh, then consider beta blockade unless the regurgitation is very severe. And I'm going to stop there. And uh, uh, you need to evaluate my, my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>